Well, um, thanks so much for today. Um, we're just trying to process through. I, I have I have like this other whole session, but then I, I, I don't know. I just always love in kind of day long retreats to have just space for Q&A. And maybe something I said didn't make sense, which is very, very possible. Um, or maybe there's some other question you might have. And, and that could be around leadership. It could be around pastoral. It could be around preaching. It, be, it could be around anything that you have. Um, but I thought maybe we could just spend a few moments. And if there are questions that you guys might have. Doug. Let me start it up. That's a great question. So um, question was, uh, you mentioned 30 at the age 30-ish. Yeah, in the 30s, that people tend to, to plateau in their preaching. And so what have I done? What have I seen? Um, I just think you get to a point where often in mid-30s, if you are a preacher, you're often getting into a role of church planner, teaching pastor. You're getting your first lead pastor job. And I think then other responsibilities are coming. And you, what you end up doing is saying, I got what I need. Uh, I got other things I got to focus on. I got I to hire another kids person. I got to, right, we got this growing ministry and the margin isn't there, but this is, this is your primary vehicle to drive. Um, and that's, that's communication, whether it's, it's speaking to a camera. Um, many of us had to learn how to do that, but it's not speaking to a camera. It's speaking through a camera and, and you'll see it. You'll see people who feel more comfortable with the podium um, and they don't know how to speak to a camera. And every, everything has changed. Um, there's parts about the com learning to have a conversation with the congregation. There's, there's, there's certain kind of tells that we all as preachers have where uh, for many of us, we just kind of go back into repeating the same metaphors, the same preaching, the same concepts. And so part of it is, is, is where do you have a mentor or where are you giving permission to actual people who are better than you in your gift. Um, oftentimes for many of us as pastors, the people who are giving us deep, uh, that are debriefing us are people who are on the payroll um, or are people who don't preach at all. So just, just imagine the kind of feedback that you get from people who don't preach. And I'm not saying you don't have those people, you should, but sometimes they can't give you actual specific feedback. They're gonna be like, ah, I just felt that one point was a little long. And then it's all, it's all kind of some sense of ethereal out there. And, um, and if someone doesn't feel safe enough to actually tell the boss or tell the, the main pastor, then everyone just kind of like, yeah, it was great. It was good. It was good. And then we, that just kind of sticks in the 40s and 50s. So you have to find mentors. You have to be really, really honest with your sound. And this is one of the hardest pieces for most communicators is to actually develop and know their sound. If you study the Beatles, they spent nine months playing 11 hours a day before an album came out in Germany, playing bars Monday through Saturday night, 11 hours playing, working, honing. And, and it was them trying to find their sound. What's so hard with younger communicators is just, just hear this for a second. Younger communicators, 30s, 40s year olds, I can, I can listen to a preacher and I can tell you who they've been listening to. And here's the crazy piece. If, if you go to a Catholic church, the reason why they all look the same is because they want, if you get transferred in the military or you moved, that when you would walk into a Catholic church, it would feel familiar. And they have this, they have this profound belief that Familiarity allows the walls of your heart to come down so that you're able to receive. But think about this if you're a communicator and one weekend you're like Judah Smith and another weekend you're like T.D. Jakes and another weekend you're like John Orberg and another weekend you're like Rick Warren. What is that subconsciously communicating to your congregation? They don't know who they are. And if they don't know who they are, I don't want to invite a friend because I don't know who this person's going to pretend to be. And I, I don't know. So you have to fight to know your sound. And then you have to know someone who isn't trying to make you be more like them, but who recognizes your unique voice and is going to help you step more into that. And that again, that is the level of development that great athletes, 
great actors, great business people, great communicators, great preachers do. And you can't bypass that. You can't skip it. It doesn't just happen. The guys, the women, the men that are the best at it, they all have coaches. And, and, and they don't talk about it, which is unfair, but they have coaches. And, and that's just, that's what raises your game. So those are the pieces. Know your sound, know someone who knows your sound and literally have them speak in and give you real coaching, real coaching. So hey there, Eric. Yeah, organization. Yeah, great question. So the question is <clears throat> how, how can a church prioritize character throughout the entire organization? And simply, simply put, when I was in college at Hope International, um, I brought a girl home to meet my parents. And after she left, after dinner, I, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what do, what do you think? And he's like, that doesn't, doesn't really matter. I'm like, no, no, no it, really, it really does matter. Like, I, I care what you think. And he goes, hey, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Every person on the planet has crazy. Every person on the planet has crazy. You just have to find the, the person's crazy that you don't wake up every morning trying to fix and change. But the kind of crazy that you can love and pray for and walk alongside and someone who's supportive of your crazy. It was really, really a helpful piece of advice. And then I got into ministry and I realized every church has crazy. Every church has crazy. Now I was at Mars Hill in Grand Rapids that had crazy. It was, it was very entrepreneurial. It was driven and led by an artist. It was off the charts. We didn't have a sign in our, in our, in our, in our front yard or whatever you call it. Like we planted the church walking through the book of Leviticus. I mean, it was crazy. Went to Rock Harbor down the road from here. It, it was not, it didn't have a leadership bone in its body. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It came from Mariners and Mariners has a profound leadership systems. It just was different. It was driven by artists and worship and Holy Spirit. And it was beautiful. I learned a lot. Went to Willow. Willow had leadership to the max. So, so every place has crazy. I think what you have to look at and and you kind of just heard it just for a second ago is you have to be able to not just watch your life closely, but you have to watch your organization. And, and you have to be able to understand where are the places that we almost have, um, we're just a little lean on. And, and some of it's often in reaction or response to. We don't want to be like that. But are there parts where in the culture you just let something go? Or there's just a little bit where maybe it works with this ministry area, but what that ends up doing is creating so much stress on somebody else. Let, let's just talk real talk, preachers. How many of you on Saturday night change your slides and it sends the entire production team into an absolute frenzy? We don't think about that because all we're thinking about, man, it's just it's for the, it's for the betterment of the church. I'm not saying that's wrong, but weekend and week out, but we don't have, sometimes we don't have that conversation. We just make that assumption. And what ends up happening is they all have to plan and shape. And then they got to go talk to artists and worship leaders, or then they got to go talk to kids, ministry volunteers. And somebody else is trying to handle one little shift that we made. And we don't think about that. And so, so part of it is, is, is recognizing, is there anything that I do and Chuck DeGroat, who's a professor at Western Seminary, wrote a book, When Narcissism Comes to Church, is a fantastic read. But Chuck just says, every church, if you want to begin to identify the crazy, is just ask certain church members or church staff, how do you experience me? How do you experience my decision making? Is there anything that I do that just causes some form of low-grade anxiety within you? Now, some, sometimes, sometimes those people aren't the right people for that position. That's fine. They can lead to a good conversation. But sometimes we're doing something in our subconscious or unbeknownst to us, but it's actually causing a lot of stress. And I think once you can be aware of that, um, you know, I, 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 I have someone who I, 
I couldn't really read. And she, she runs communications, uh, a big part of the, for a church that I teach at often. I couldn't read her. And, and I was just sending her slides on Friday. And I didn't know it was her day off. And she didn't think she could tell me. She's like, you're, you're, you're Steve Carter. Like, you're, the, you're like the teaching pastor. You're like, I, and I'm like, what? So I just walked to her and I said, hey, are we okay? And, she, and she's like, yeah, we're fine. And I was like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't, you didn't sell me very well. Like, is, is, how, and I just asked the Chuck questions. Is there, any, how do you experience me? Is there anything I'm doing that's, and she just said, gosh, it's just, it makes my life a little bit harder when you set, you just send slides on Friday. And I, I want to be game, but it's like every week I get that, I get, I just have to like go against my Sabbath to, to do this. And I want to, and I want to help you, but I, and I was like, oh, you could have told me that. But sometimes people don't feel like they can. So I think asking those questions and then just really being able to take an honest look. Um, vision leaks really, really quickly. Character leaks very, very quickly. And the moments that I think sometimes we make assumptions of our younger staff, we make assumptions of our staff, I think going slowly and trying to break down what actually happened. Right now you're seeing this in all of leadership because of COVID, there has been a lack of training. And what's really, really hard for Starbucks and for different kind of organizations that have a lot of staff is actually training culture. And you're seeing a breakdown of culture. So you, the, the level of intentionality is, if you see something, it's no shame or shade, but man, let's talk about that. I, I've been spending a lot of time right now. I, I see a lot of staff just very, very worried, very, very worried. And so I've just been spending time in, in, our, in our staff meetings saying, hey, I heard a great quote by Dan Zandra. It says, worry is a misuse of imagination. So all of a sudden in the present moment, a worry comes and that's going to happen. But then all of a sudden you linger on that and now you are misusing imagination. And instead of choosing the wonder and being full of wonder in this moment of what God might be up to, all of a sudden you start asking, what if, 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 and it takes you out of your body. It takes you out of the, so let's process that. And let's, so let's try to play that stuff out. And so a lot of that has been the stuff that we're trying to, trying to do. It's a good question, Eric. Other questions? On that Yes, yes. Well, and, and part of that, so, in the VIM plan, vision, intention, and means, oftentimes when the intention is talked about, is also identifying what self-sabotaging strategies you will have that will allow you to drop that anchor. Um, and, and what's amazing is, so it's Cal State Fullerton, we fly to Manhattan, Kansas to play Kansas State University, and it was awesome. It's a real great environment for a basketball game. And we're doing like layups and every time I would touch the ball, the student section would yell, coach's son, coach's son, because I think they thought the only way that I could be on the team was I must be the coach's son. And so, so we have this moment where like we go into uh, the locker room. And I think, I think myself and Kenroy Jarrett um, were, were probably the only two Christians on the team. And I had been hoping that we'd have a moment of prayer. And, and all of a sudden, coach said, all right, everyone, bow your heads. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is fantastic. We're going to pray. But it wasn't a prayer. He said, I want to lead you in a visualization exercise. I was like, oh, all right. He goes, if, you, if you're dribbling the ball up the court, and in basketball there's five people on, on the court uh, on, on each team, and they're going man defense. And all of a sudden they switch from man to a press, which means they're, they're going to pick you up full court. How will you respond? And let's say the refs make a bad call and they will make a bad call and they make a bad call on you, how will you respond? And if you miss an easy jump shot, how will you respond? And when the student section starts mocking you and saying things about your family, how will you respond? And, he, and for like five minutes, he just asked, he asked these questions. And again, what he was trying to get at is reaction versus response. And anytime you react, you're often reenacting the past. So the self-sabotaging strategy is part of that embodied will when you just keep making impulsive decisions to do what you want to do. 
oh man, this is how I wanted to escape this moment with my, with my wife. Instead of saying what I wanted to say, I just got up and walked away. Or I wanted to escape this feeling, and so I went and I bought something. I, I wanted to escape this feeling, so I, so I just went and I ate something. I wanted to escape this feeling, so I went and achieved. And part of what you have to be able to do is realize if I'm going to actually embody this vision, I, I desperately want to be a person of self-control. Well, what am I going to do? And, and underneath that, though, is a level, and, and it's, it's a word that, that often comes when we think about um, uh, sexual intimacy, but, it, but it's the word consent. And part of consent is consenting to reality. And what you have to do is you have to recognize as you being a person in process, there are parts that you have to consent to. That when you are sad, temptation might lead you here because it's led you there in the past. When you are stressed, temptation might tempt you to go here because it's done that in the past. And for you to actually stop the self-sabotage, there might be things that you have to consent to, to say, I can't. So for instance, I was interviewing AJ Sherrill on the podcast, Craft and Character podcast, and we were talking about this and he said, when he's, oh, when he's at home, he can't have wine after 8 p.m. He said it affects his sleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night, the sugar and wine. Um, and when he's on the road, he can't have alcohol after 6 p.m. That is a consent to reality. Does that make sense? So, so it's not just the identifying the self-sabotaging techniques, but it's also going, I've identified it and I know my play to actually consent to go, I'm not at my best and if I choose this, I'm literally, it's gonna make it even more easy for me to drop that anchor. So, so this is just, this is part of the development um, and some people break that down uh, but I, I, for me, that has been really, really helpful to go, yep, when I'm this, it's going to be easier for me to drop that anchor and choose this. And instead of actually reflecting and experiencing um, the grace in that. So, any more questions? I love these guys. I love Q&A. It's the best. I'm going to answer this question two ways. He asked, uh, I see you reference pop culture. Do you ever get pushed back from that? So, two ways. Um, one is every one of you who preach on the regular, your church has a sound. Okay, your church has a familiar sound and the communicator has a familiar sound. Oftentimes, if I go guest preach somewhere, the first question I'll ask the pastor who invites me is, what does a win look like? If, can you share with me two talks where someone from the outside came and preached and did a great job and can you share with me one talk that didn't do well? Because I want to see. I want to see what works and what doesn't work. And also, what's fascinating is oftentimes churches, they don't have codified, absolute clarity of what a win looks like from the, from the platform. Because it's been, it's been Pastor Bill for four months or 40, 40 years or 28 years. They, they, it's just his voice, his sound. So, so for, for what I did at, at Willow is I identified um, what I felt like were the five essential marks. And so any guest teacher came, if you hit this, you're going to do well. You probably get invited back. You hit four of the five, yeah, maybe. Three of the five, for sure not. I just, I, just, I just knew that culture well enough. So first one was this. Uh, it, was, it was gospel good news. So like you had to teach me something about the Bible that I didn't know. R was real life relevant. Somehow it had to be able to engage the, the, the room. A, it was application driven. C, it was challenge. It was high challenge. It, it, if it was a soft challenge, didn't work. You had to challenge the heck out of us. We were challenge addicts. And then E, energy management, because that room was 7,200 seats. So you had to be able to move that room. Now, that's just the sound of Willow. Then I had my sound. And basically, I, I do this like on a coaching standpoint to help people find their sound, but I had my sound. And in mine, part of that, in that environment, was real life and relevant, allowed me to be fully me, which is going to be 
Dave Chappelle, a little bit of sports. Um, but you have to know that line. You have, now, if I was going to a primary exegesis-driven culture, that's going to go, no, no, you, you live in Philippians 1, and you're going to break down when Paul's in chains, and he's going to talk about advancing the gospel. This is where we live. I will bore you to death with prokope and proscope and the difference of those two words. Like, I, I will live, and it's not, it's not an assimilation piece, but what my job is to serve the sound of the house, not get them to have to join with me. Now, there are some houses and churches that I know that I have been invited to, I'm not going to work. Just, just it's not, it's not going to be the best opportunity for me to be the fullest expression of who God made me to be. And I'm going to have to lose parts to try and do that. And that's not going to be. So that's my, that's the big ethereal piece. Personally, for me, I want, I want, I want, when I think about preaching, I think about from a sixth grader to a scholar. I want a sixth grader to go, I want to go hear that guy again. I, I, and, and not just I want to hear that guy, I, I literally want, I'm intrigued and I want what that, that guy has. That, that's, to the scholar to go, eh, 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 a little too many jokes, but like I really, I really, I think he handled the text well. Like I want everything in between. But deep down, I want to, I want to help you put this thing into practice. I want to be a co like a spiritual coach as a pastor to not just tell you a great thing about worry, but I want you to be able to think, what do you worry about? And I want to make that as practical and relevant. I will quote Kendrick Lamar. I will quote um, a, a biography. I'll quote a movie as long as it drives towards the more redemptive plan of Christ. And that's just, that's, that I think it feels like how I would be having a conversation with Brian Maxwell. We could talk about Kobe to we could talk about Jesus to we could talk about uh, some spiritual desert mother. You know, so it's just how do I have that same conversation with the congregation? So does that make sense? Yeah. Great question. There was another one over here, I thought. There was one yeah, over here. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Great question. So uh, how do I arrange a talk? If, if you gave me a passage of scripture, I'm looking for three things right from the jump. Um, and it, it's the word ache, it's the word desire, and it's the word stronghold. Ache, desire, stronghold. Now, hold those three words right here, ache, desire, stronghold. Oftentimes, what many of us were trained to do at Bible college and seminary is once you get a passage to go to the commentaries. I love Scott McKnight. The guy's the real deal. I, I love Golden Gay. I, 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 I love, love scholarship. The problem is Scott McKnight isn't the authority of the church that God has entrusted you to lead. Scott is an authority when it comes to the church in Rome. Ben Witherton is an authority when it comes to Galatia. He is an authority when it comes to Corinthians and Corinth. Not Covina. Corinth. N not Yorba Linda. Galatia. So, so you have to be able to discern what is the ache of your congregation. They are coming in with an ache. And there are spiritual strongholds in your city and in your county. I, I, I can go all day about Orange County. I can tell you what the strongholds are. The difference between what I hear, and this isn't full Orange County, but I would say more towards Newport. Like the difference between what I hear in Starbucks at Newport and, the diff and, and in uh, Chicago, just listen to the conversations. In Chicago, it's, it's, it's literally about like global issues and economy. And in Newport, it was about fashion and gossip. Just different. So the different, different, different strongholds. Now, I can mock and, and, and speak truthfully about Chicagoland too, the areas that we have it fully wrong. But, but when you start to approach a text and I'm reading it, I'm trying to find the context not just from the text, but in my unique context. What's that ache? What's the good desire that this writer is wanting to call out? And what is the good desire in our congregation that people want to be equipped? They want to know. They want to embody this. And if they actually do this, 
how will it help them go against a stronghold that the enemy has in this territory? What's the text, the problem that this text is addressing? What's the premise from God's word? And then what's the promise I can offer my listener to actually, if they put this into practice, it will literally help them live a more righteous or godly or discipleship oriented life. So those are the, just the back thoughts. Then I start, I, I start writing through questions. Man, I think, uh, for instance, uh, I just did a talk recently on Matthew 6, and there's this phrase, uh, you will have received your reward in full. And Jesus says, if you pray in public, you're like, they will receive the reward in full. In full. If, if people see what you give, they will receive the reward in full. And it's, it, it just hit me is that how many of us, when we post on social media, are trying to curry favor and we're, we got our reward in full with 87 likes. We try to seem like, oh, I just need, I just, I was, you, you can see it. Like you can see it in people who are just not having a good day and they just want people to validate them. They received a reward in full. You got what you wanted. And how often do we do that? And I just started stretching this. How often, we, you got what you wanted, your reward in full. Like you got that brand new car, it's awesome, it's amazing. But what you got was the attention of that new car. You got what you wanted, reward in full. Like there's all these things that we start to do. And in the certain context that I was speaking at, just trying to hit that, that's the problem. But there's a desire in there that's really, really beautiful. And I think sometimes we shame desire to say, you want to be noticed. You want to be seen. Well, what does that look like in the proper way? And then if we actually were the kind of people that could see the Imago Dei, um, I'll tell this story. Brian Maxwell, he's a pastor at, at, at Wilshire Avenue in Fullerton, and he used to, and this, their church still does, but used to lead this, uh, this sports program in their gym. And I lived in Fullerton at the time, and so I coached uh, this kid's soccer team. We were 9-0. and oh, We were undefeated. Uh, <laughs> our team was called the Orange Monkey Fireballs, and it was amazing. And he was fantastic leading this thing. But, but I, what I did one year was I gave, after every game, I gave every parent a note card with a number on it. And the number was a, a, a different kid's number than their own. And I asked them to affirm them. And after the first game, every parent, all they knew how to affirm was performance, not character. So I had to take like the parents to like the, the, the shed a little bit and say, hey, no, 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 I need you to affirm their, call out the good. And they didn't know how to do it. And it wasn't until like game eight or nine that they figured it out. So I think what we have to do is figuring out, man, what does it look like to call out that good desire and not center ourselves, but center the actual people in our congregation who are doing this and how they're actually attacking the strongholds. So I will hold process when it comes to like the study, the study briefs, the notes, how I manuscript, how I storyboard through like note cards, all of that stuff. But at the heart of it, it's ache, desire, stronghold, problem, premise, promise. And when I, when I can find that thing and I can make that into a sentence, um, one of the greatest preachers from 100 years ago, Jewett, said if you can't preach your message in a sentence, it's not ready to preach. And in this day and age, I think there's many, many communicators who are trying to be clever rather than clear. And our ability, I think, more than ever is to be clear and clever. But if I have to choose one, I'll choose clarity all day. It's a great Jimmy at World album too, so. Yeah, yeah. The question was, um, Doug mentioned that he cut his teeth listening to Bill Hybels and that one of the things that he respected most about Bill was Bill's ability to challenge the socks off people. And he asked if uh, pastors today, uh, in my opinion, are challenging uh, their congregations. And I'd say no. And so what, what, what is that? I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer because um, there's a couple ways of challenge, right? There's a prophetic challenge where you have to speak out or speak up about something. And that has a cost. It has a cost in numbers and has a cost in, in, in butts and seats and has a co cost in, in bills that get put into the, the, the offering. And so you have to make that decision. And generationally speaking, I think there's generations that have handled this better than others. Second thing is you sometimes see people challenge, but they're very, very unaware and it showcases a low EQ. Because 
if you think about poker, all right, so let's just imagine this was a poker table. Let's imagine Gabe in the back is the dealer. So Gabe's dealing, right? When I, when I started to watch poker on ESPN, it frustrated me because it's not a sport. And so I started to like read up on this. I'm like, why, why, why is this a game? Like, what does it matter? Because I always thought if I got dealt pocket aces, like that's, those are the two best cards you can be dealt, I win the hand. But I, I, I was watching people who would have the best cards lose the hand. And I realized something as I started reading and studying kind of the, the makeup of what makes a great poker player is that there's other things happening. And sometimes when you think about the challenge, you think, oh, I've got the, I got pocket aces. I got Jesus. I got Easter. I got resurrection. I got it all. I got it right here. But the problem is, is sometimes younger communicators are unaware of their position at the table. How does the congregation view you? And it doesn't matter what your cards are. It does, but it doesn't. It does, but it doesn't. It matters who's in the hand and what people are you actually speaking to? How do they view you? How do you view them? And how many chips do you, of influence do you have? And so you can have a younger teacher who can speak with truth, but if, if he's got tone and no chips, it's not going to go very well. And we saw that happen. So in one sense, it's, it's a challenge issue of sp prophetic challenge. Sometimes it's, it's a lack of, you've got to be really, really highly aware of how many chips of influence that you have. And, and if you're a younger communicator who has an older voice ahead of you, have they given chips for you? But here's the other piece. If we're talking day-to-day, weekend, week-out challenge, I think that we don't know necessarily how to get, we, we can tell an emotional story that can get someone to the edge, we just don't know how to kick them over. And, and so I listen to a lot of talks and I'll see a pastor identify the problem, proclaim a beautiful premise, exegeting God's word unbelievably well, and walking them into a moment of an invitation, whether to the gospel or an invitation into some kind of next step of d discipleship. And this is actual a promise that God will use to bless their life. And you know what happens? I'm just going to pray right now. And um, they opt out. Like, I, it, 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 I, it boggles my mind. You have literally built this whole thing for this moment. For what? And it just showcases a profound level of insecurity for me in the communicator that you don't think that the people were with you. If you watch old YouTube videos, what you see with Bono is that he needed to hold the Irish flag. And somebody asked him why, and he said, because I didn't trust that the lyrics could stand on their own. Joshua Tree, what? And, he need, and I think some of us, we haven't sat with the text. Some of it's because we only practice the introduction and we run out of time. Some of us, we have a profound insecurity. Some of us, we're afraid to make the ask. And I'm just telling you, friends, if, if, if you're going to preach, just think about it like this. A great comedian has a setup. Okay? The setup is going to lead to some sense of surprise. Right? A setup... And it's trying to get you to go with them on a story, on a track. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be some flip of the script, some sense of twist, some turn that's going to literally make you die laughing. The idea of a challenge, though. You build up a problem, some sense of obstacle. There is a setup. And then you have to declare, you have to think through, what is the next best right step? And you can't let them off the hook. You can't give them an out. You, you get like a little whimsy or woozy or, or insecure. What you're going to do is you're going to give them all the time in the world to pick up their phone and check a text. You want... you. you 
I mean, I could talk all day about this because it fires me up. Because I seriously, from a sense of a preacher and communicator, the amount of moments, you've all seen this, you're sitting there watching and going, yeah, that guy just, that, that guy, that woman, that, they just walked that person to the edge and instead of inspiring them to take the next step, they said, isn't that a nice view? All right, time to go home. So, so think about it. You have to ask yourself, what, what, what am I afraid of? Making someone uncomfortable? Welcome to preaching. What am, I, what am I afraid of? They say no. It's not your decision. It's their decision. You're offering them a chance at free life, new life, invitation to say yes, invitation to grace, invitation to the next step of generosity, next step of leadership, next step. They say no. Okay. But it's pastoral malpractice for us not to inspire, compel, or challenge our people to be all that God intends for them to be. That's how I see it. Sorry, I get fired up about that. And just, just ask yourself this though, real quick on this. What do you want for your people? Like, I, what, do you, what, do you, what do you desire for them? Your, your people, I know Simon Sinek, and I know Craig Rochelle, and I, lo, I like, great, 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 great. And I know they talk about start with why, and that, that's true for leadership. You gotta be able to know your why. But do you know what your people are asking? How? How? How do I do this? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to raise my kids in COVID. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how, when I live in Southern California, and, and how to buy a house and give. I don't, I don't know how to do all of this. I don't know how to have disciplines in a culture that's so fast-paced and frenzy and hurried. I don't know how to. And what you have to do is you have to paint that vision and give them that challenge and show them what their life can be based on the truth of God's Word and the fuel of the Holy Spirit. And when that heart comes out, when those stories come from that place, when you are so, and you know what you're going to say, and know what made Bill so great at challenge and was the best I've ever seen on the planet, he wrote it all out. The verbal precision of that guy, and in this day and age, I know someone's going to go on Twitter and I'm going to get blasted because I'm giving him credit, but I'm telling you, the verbal precision, and I would see his notes, and he would underline a word, Underline a word twice, underline a word three times, circle a word, box a phrase. I mean, he would spend 18 months to get the one phrase, holy discontent. He's like, I got the book done. I don't have the title. And, and, and so when you get that level of verbal precision and it sings and it moves you, I spend so much time walking and talking into my phone trying to get the challenge right. It doesn't just happen. And literally just working, now that phrase is too long. I was working on this one around the worry and wonder, and I'm like, man, it's so crazy. We use the word worry some and wonderful. How do I be full of wonder and, and, and live a life of some worry? Like I just, but I was like, that's so lame. It doesn't work, it doesn't, and I just like, but you just keep playing with it. You keep playing with it to find it, to find it, to find it. And once you have it and then you speak it, and you feel, and every communicator's had this experience, you feel the room lean in, absolute gold. But when you don't have it, and you're trying to find it on stage, and everybody's leaning out, the worst feeling on stage. So let me just end with this. Um, and uh, I think if there's anything I would want you to hold on to today, is what you do matters. Um, God's gifted you. God's graced you with a unique grace and a unique moment and a unique time. You have everything you need in Christ. You have everything you need to be a person of great character, a person who really takes their craft to the full potential. And you also are living in a cultural, crazy moment. It's true. A number of years ago, um, uh, Bob Goff, um, who I've known for a number of years through my time at Willow. And every time he'd come to Chicago, uh, he would teepee my house, which is just weird when a 60-year-old te teepees your house. 
but I was going through just the, the real heartache of what was happening at Willow and, and, and Bob came out and I'll never forget it. And I, 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 just, I just felt weighty and I felt heavy and, and Bob just came up to me and he said, hey, which way is north? I'm like, what? He's like, you know, he's just like, he's just so like Red Bull in the flesh. You know, he's just like, which, which way is north? And I was like, up? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. And, and no joke, he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a kid's compass. And he, he opens it up and he's like, okay, okay. He's like, that way. That's north. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, I'm like, I have no idea what you're doing. He goes, the book of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, Jesus. He's our true north. You're not going to be able to make everybody happy. You're not going to be able to, to please everyone. There are going to be people who think you're heretics and they're going to not like you. It, it doesn't matter. Your whole job is to take as many people with you to point them towards true north. He hands me this compass. He bear hugs me and goes, I think you can do it. And he leaves. <laughs> and I just find myself putting this compass in my pocket. And there's so many moments, I don't know what I'm doing. But I know he does. And I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know where it's going to be in five years or ten years. And I, I don't know if I'll ever be on a stage as big as Willow. I don't care. What I really, really care about is going, how do I faithful in this next step? And how every Sunday am I one weekend closer to finishing well? Day by day, moment by moment, continually taking as many people with me towards what it means to be an apprentice and disciple of a rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus Christ. And you can do this. You can do this. Take as many people with you. There's a lot of things that are preaching to a lot of people right now about escape and numbing out and making life easier. And I think right now people are thirsting and hungry to understand how this book still makes sense today. And it does, more than ever. And we gotta embody it, but we gotta preach it we got to challenge people to it. And just like the Pope said, preach. Preach Jesus. Don't ever stop preaching Jesus. I, I implore that to you. Please, more than ever, finish well.